whether they're on earth, if you have faith in your Savior, you are part of that. Um, if you don't have faith, you are not part of it, even if you belong to a Christian church. Then, um, so the Holy Christian Church is the communion of saints. And then you, we have the visible church, local congregation, a divine group of people gathered around the means of grace, different from the Holy Christian Church in that there are many of them, many different uh, visible churches, many denominations. They are visible, defined by membership. You can see who they are because they, people belong to it. There will always be hypocrites within it. Um, wish that weren't the case. Um, but there's going to be hypocrites in it. Jesus told the, the parable of the wheat and the, the tares. Um, and now we're to where we want to start with today. Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. That's on the second page of the uh, lesson 9. Second page of lesson 9. We didn't get very far last time. So as we look to this, uh, would someone like to read that, those verses? <clears throat> Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Okay, this is talking about the church and, and, and likening the church believers as into a building, a temple. And notice it's also uh, talked about as members of God's household. And that's a wondrous thought that we are now, as part of this holy Christian church, members of God's household. Are we slaves in God's household? No, we are children of God. We're part of God's very family itself. Now the question is asked, um, the cornerstone of the church is what? According to these verses. Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. He's the cornerstone upon which everything is, is founded. Define a cornerstone. What's a cornerstone? First stone laid. Okay. In modern times, what is a cornerstone? Yeah, usually a plaque that's on a corner of a building to say when it was built. And that's really all it serves. In the olden days, Jesus' days, what was the purpose of a cornerstone? And it was the first one laid. But it also directed the rest of the building. It directed everything that showed the lines for the rest of the building, how it would be. And it was very crucial, crucial that it would be perfect, that it had to be perfectly Square or rectangular, I mean, the angles had to be just perfect because everything would be lined up off of that. Jesus is the perfect cornerstone upon which the whole temple, the church, stands. Um, and you have a, there a corner, picture of a cornerstone. Um, the foundation of the church is? Apostles and prophets. Okay. Um, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, God's word. which is God's word. Apostles and prophets, this refers to God's word. Apostles would refer to what? What was that? Okay, but the apostles, when it says the apostles and prophets. New Testament, Old Testament? New Testament is apostles, prophets would be the Old Testament. All of God's word is the foundation upon which it stands. So when we look at what do we believe, where do we turn? Easy, God's word. And yet we see so many so-called Christian churches that are looking to something else um, to, to take their stand on and not the word alone. But this is the, the, the um, foundation. Oops. And then uh, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 6, uh, would someone like to read that? Anne? As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him Okay, and as we look at that, the living stones that make up the church 
are what? Believers. Believers. All Christians. And notice what it says, that you are also like living stones. That's all believers are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy what? Priesthood. In the Old Testament, could anyone serve as a priest? No. Who only could serve as priest? The descendants of Aaron. The descendants of Aaron. Um, you had the Levites also who helped out at the temple. But when it came to priests, the descendants of Aaron, particularly the high priest. And you look at that, they offered the sacrifices in behalf of the people. Basically, what role did they play for the people and God? They were the intermediary between the people and God. And why did the people need an intermediary? Your sins have separated you from God. And so they needed this go-between to go back and forth from God for them. Here's the sacrifices and then that day of atonement, that once, once a year sacrifice, go behind the curtain um, and make the sacrifice from the people. And by the way, if you, you've read recently about the high priest on the day of atonement, how exactly was it that he was to go behind the, the curtain? Was it just a matter, oh, it's the Day of Atonement, I'm going to walk behind that curtain, and um, that's that? It was quite a process. There was a process. What's the first thing that he had to do? Atone for his own sins. Even before he atoned for his own sins, what's the first thing he had to do? He had to wash. And then in the temple, you had that altar of incense. And the incense was burnt to provide smoke, which symbolized prayers going up. The prayers going up to God. But on the Day of Atonement, what did he do with the incense? Do you remember? He took it, and it's burning, making all this smoke, and he took it behind the curtain and pushed it in behind the curtain for what reason? So that the most holy place would be filled with smoke so he couldn't fully see what? The most, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. Remember, he was going to go and pour the blood on the mercy seat first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people. But first he had to have that smoke in there to, to make it so he couldn't fully see it because no one could see God and live. I mean, it was quite the procedure that was there that the high priest followed to, to intercede for the people. New Testament, who are the priests? Well, just the ones that are ordained, aren't they, in the Catholic Church? And, and then you can have archbishops that make proclamations about members not receiving mass for certain reasons, <laughs> as was done recently. No. You all are this priesthood. We all are that priesthood, which means what, by the way? When it says that, that um, uh, to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, what does that mean, that we're this priesthood? We can go directly to God. We don't need another intermediary because we are in Jesus. We go straight to God. We don't need someone going to God for us. We don't need to have... And, and, and by the way, you look at, at, at the epistles and Acts, and it talks about the early Christian church. That early Christian church, did they set up a priesthood? Did they have priests? Or did they have ministers? There's two different things. Did they have priests or did they have ministers? Ministers. ministers. They did not set up a priesthood again. Why not? Didn't need, it. Didn't need it. Why make sacrifices for sins when once for all sacrifice had been made? So there was no more sacrificing to be done. So the priest didn't have anything to do. Later on, in the history of the church, all of a sudden you had a Christian church coming up with the priesthood again. 
when did that take place and why? Or let, let me say, why did that take place? That's a little easier to answer. Why did it take place that all of a sudden, what in, in the New Testament are called ministers or pastors, which means servants or shepherds, all of a sudden they revert back to having priests? Because what did the priest do? To be, your intermediary. to be your intermediary for the sacrifices you had to make. As soon as the church started teaching that, yes, Jesus paid for your sins, but you have to pay for their actual consequences on earth and pay Jesus back, all of a sudden you have to do something. How do you know what to do? How much to do? Who's going to be your intermediary here in the sacrificing? Who's going to make that re-sacrifice of Christ's body and blood on a daily basis for you? And all of a sudden you had to come up with priests because sacrifices were being done again. And don't kid yourself. What do they call the Mass? The re-sacrifice of Jesus. They look on it as re-sacrificing Jesus to pay for your sins. And so all of a sudden you need to have priests. No, 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 no. Peter says, you're the priesthood. You are. And you are, um, you are offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. What's your spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God? Your firstborn? Sometimes we like it, but... <laughs> What's your, your spiritual sacrifices acceptable to the Lord? Your worship, your praise of him. We come here to church, and is it a passive thing? Is worship meant to be a passive thing, where you sit back in the pew and everything's done up front, and you just sit back and absorb it all? No. No. It never was in the Old Testament. It never was in the New Testament. It was an interactive thing. God speaks to us, his word. What do we do in return? We give him our praise. We sing hymns to him. We use our voices to praise him. Spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to the Lord in Christ Jesus. Um, our godly living. Is that our sacrifice to the Lord too? Yeah. A sac what kind of sacrifice would it be? A sin sacrifice, we're doing all these good deeds in order to make up for our sin? A thanksgiving sacrifice. Lord, thank you for saving me. Now I want to live for you. But we are the priesthood, a glorious thing. And the living stones that make up the church are all Christians. It's this building being built up, and everyone who believes in Jesus is part of that. So key terms, church versus church. Church with capital C versus small c church the capital C is Holy Christian Church, all believers everywhere. Small C Church is a local assembly where God's word is preached and the sacraments are used. Examples, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, whatever you might want to say. Um, it's where the, God's word is preached and the sacraments are used. There we call that a Christian church. Why? Because wherever the word is proclaimed and the sacraments are used, who's at work? The Holy Spirit and the word is not going to return empty and so there's going to be believers there and so we call only those church groups out there that proclaim God's word and use the sacraments Christian now there's a number of churches out there that call themselves Christians but they don't use God's word and they don't have the sacraments and so even though they call themselves Christians, we would say they are not Christian. Such as what? Mormon. Mormon church. They found that they could steal a lot of Christians by pretending to be Christian, calling themselves Christian. Do they have the sacraments? No. Do they baptize with water and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Yes. Is that a valid baptism? No, because who are they baptizing into? Three different gods, not the triune God. 
It is not a valid sacrament. Do they use God's word? Somewhat. But they also use what? Book of Mormon plus other things. And basically they don't have the word of God because the Bible is subordinate to the writings of Joseph Smith and others. And it has to fall underneath that. They don't have the word. They're not, even though they call themselves Christian, they are not a Christian church. Um, but we call a group of believers a church. And, and a visible church, whether that be a small congregation or a larger synod, however you want to call it. You look at, at a church group, by the way, um, like the ELCA, which stands for what? Evangelical. Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which was an amalgamation of the LCA, if you remember the old Lutheran Church of America, ALC, American Lutheran Church, and AELC, American Evangelical Lutheran Church. They all merged, I believe it was in the 70s, and um, became one group. And um, you look at today where you have any, really anything and anything going on uh, in that um, uh, church group. They just, uh, for a while there, they were um, uh, rejoicing over the fact in California they had their first um, bishop who was a transgender I don't even know male or female what it was, but they were made a big thing of it, and then finally someone took disciplinary action and, and booted her, him, it, whatever, and um, uh, got rid of it. But uh, uh, they just came out, by the way, with this whole, that whole SCOTUS um, memorandum that came out on Roe versus Wade. They just came out with a statement saying that we need to keep Roe versus Wade. That the, the ability to have abortions is a God-given right, okay? Christian? Christian? Biblical? No. And the same thing is um, they come out with a statement now that there are other ways to get to heaven than through Jesus. Biblical? Lutheran? No. Because it, it's their heritage, I guess. Um, but you, you, know, you know, with as colorful as Martin Luther was, I mean, what did he call Dr. Eck in the uh, debates with him? Dreck. And what's Dreck in German? Dirt. What? Dirt or <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a four-letter word for manure. Uh, is, is really what Drek is. And um, what would he say today, do you think, if his, he were around today about the ELCA? I, I, it would be fun. It would be fun. Yeah. He goes, how did we get this far? Yeah. Yeah. But when you don't take your stand on God's word, you do. Is, now, again, one of their official teachings they've come out with, the Synod as a group, it says um, there are other ways to get to heaven than through Jesus. They're calling Jesus a liar who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But they're saying, no, Jesus was wrong. There's other ways. Are they a Christian church? Political. They're political, but are they, do we still call them a Christian church? And the answer is, they do yes. The they use the word, and they have the sacraments. And so even, and praise you, Lord, even in <clears throat> that church, that, I was going to say that cesspool of a church, but even in that church there are believers. Yeah. And thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you that your word and sacraments work. And that's a joyous, joyous thing to know. Um, and, and it's the same thing with uh, when you get down to the denominations, um, Baptist, uh, Assembly of God, Methodist, uh, Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Lutheran, or whatever else it is. What saves you? Your faith in Jesus or your church membership? Your faith in Jesus. And again, where the word and sacraments are being used, the Holy Spirit is bringing people to faith and praise the Lord for that. Because just as God wants, so do we. We want all to be saved that is there. So uh, again, the capital C church, the small c church, the local assembly of believers. Holy Christian Church, there's one holy, invisible,
Christian church. It's one, it's holy, it's invisible. Invisible because only God can see person's faith. We can see evidence of the faith, but we can't see faith itself. Um, local congregations, many of them, not holy, it's a mixture of true believers and hypocrites. And it's visible. You can see it, you can see the members, they show up on a Sunday, etc. Which church do I join? Though through faith we are all members of the one holy Christian church. Faith puts us in the holy Christian church. But we are faced with many choices concerning which church local congregation to join. When you look at a local congregation to join, what do you want to look for? The wells. You want to look at their, if, confession? their confession. What do they teach about the gospel? What do they teach about the gospel? Um, and basically, that's the most important thing because that's what determines many times where your soul is headed. Now, well, before we get into this, let's look at the, the many different uh, churches that are there. And I told you last time that you can basically boil them down to four. And by the way, you can read this on your own at home. It just has a little history of uh, the church, the emergence of Rome, Martin Luther, and then the uh, uh, Lutheran Church in America, and then Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Look at that, I don't want to spend much time. But just realize that as you look at that timeline of the church, it started out the first 300 years, there was just one. It was under attack, persecuted, and the people were just holding on to the faith. Then all of a sudden it became the accepted church um, by the Roman Empire. And once it became the accepted church, then politics got involved and you started having uh, division. And the first division was between the Orthodox Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Church, the Western Church. And it was basically a political fight over which, who was to head the church. Now that it was, was accepted, now that it had grown, now that it had power, who's going to be the leader? And the bishops of which two cities claimed headship? Constantinople, Constantinople and Rome. Constantinople for the Eastern, Rome for the Western. And again, it was a political fight. Which bishop was better, more powerful? You had the Roman emperors at times ceding their power. The pope had to take over in Rome or ceding their power as they went over to Constantinople because of the dangers that were there. They went to Constantinople. And so you had a fight between those two factions. Both the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox throughout this time got caught up in the false doctrine of work righteousness. Basically, the work righteousness of you had to do something to add to what Jesus has done, whether it's go through the divine liturgy or the veneration of relics in the Eastern Orthodox Church, or whether it's the penance and the veneration of relics that was there in the Western Roman Catholic Church, both taught that system of of uh, uh, work righteousness that was there that crept in. And by the way, it easily creeps into a church. Why is that? Why is it so easy for that work righteous attitude in some way or another to creep into a, a Christian church? It's in, our nature. it's in our nature. We're born with that opinion like as I have to do something to make God love me. And so you have that twofold divergence of the Christian churches going on until the year 1066, you had the, the Great Schism. And the Great Schism, I mentioned it briefly last time, was because of what? Why did the two basically say, we have nothing to do with each other? Was the Pope making his position? OK. Ostensibly, it was over what's called the Filioqua controversy, that the Roman Catholic Church and the Nicene Creed put, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Filioque is Latin for and the Son. And the Eastern Orthodox said, no, it only proceeds from the Father, which is not true, by the way. And um, so uh, uh, they split apart, but really it was because who had the power? And the Roman bishop called the Pope, was taking more and more power, and finally they said, it's not going to work. Uh, we're going to split apart, 1066. So then you had the two divergent ones. 
up until 1517 when what happened? Reformation. The Reformation. And why is that called the Reformation, not the Renovation? Or he just wanted to reform the church. Martin Luther wanted to reform the church and go back to the true teaching of God's word, but the church wouldn't have it. They ended up excommunicating him, putting him under the, uh, the uh, death sentence if he got outside the protection of the German princes. And um, finally, he started the third church line, which is Lutheran. And by the way, he never wanted it to be called Lutheran Church. He says, how can you name a church after a sinner like me? But he then acceded to that when... when um, Along the same time since the Reformation, you had Zwingli, Calvin, etc. come on, on and they, they, divert, they didn't agree with Luther, particularly over uh, one various area, and that is, and they became known as the Reformed or Protestant churches. Sometimes Lutherans are, are lumped in with that, but really it's a different branch because you had the Lutheran church, um, Melanchthon tried to make peace with Martin Luther and say, let's join together, and uh, they couldn't agree on the Lord's Supper, that Jesus' body and blood were truly present in there. Because Melanchthon, Calvin, and the rest were all under the, the auspices that what is needed to understand God's word? Reason. So everything had to fall under reason, and if it didn't make sense, you didn't believe it. When Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, he's up in heaven, how can he be down here? He can't be down here, so he's not really present. He's just saying, this resembles my body and blood, which is not what Jesus says and which is not what the Bible teaches. And so you had that big divergence. And then you go from there, and you can look at every denomination that's out there. Every Christian denomination is going to fall under Orthodox Catholic, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, or um, Reformed. What about the non-denominational churches? Aren't they non-denominational? They have no denomination. They have the same belief system. You can tell which branch they're under if you go and ask them about what? What do you believe about yeah. baptism and communion? And you'll get your answer right away. Do you baptize babies? Well, if the parents want them baptized, we'll baptize them. But then we'll do it again when they get older and can make the decision for themselves. Or, well, that tells you they're reformed. Um, you just ask them about those two things. And even though they say they're non-denominational, we're not tied to any denomination, they are under that fourth branch, reformed Protestant. So any, any of them are going to fall under one, maybe a couple of them. You have some that are um, um, Catholicia and Reformed, like the Church of England, which, by the way, the Church of England over in the United States is what? Uh, Presbyterian and the Episcopalian churches are branches of that. So they came over here and um, the Episcopalians pretty much kept the same things from the Church of England over there, but the Presbyterians objected to something. And what was that? And by the way, presbyter means elder. What do you think they objected to? The priesthood. The, priesthood. the very elaborate priesthood that the Church of England had. And so they said, over here, we want the churches run by presbyters or elders. Um, but it's basically the same religion, but it just doesn't have the same priesthood. But the, the elders running thing, that, and the interesting in history, who wanted to have Martin Luther come and set up his church, Lutheran church, in their country? A king. Henry the Eighth. Um, Luther came on the scene. And remember, Luther was the most published person because the printing press had just come online and, and um, they were looking for things to publish and here's Luther churning out one thing after another after another so they're just glomming onto it and it's going all over the place. Henry VIII 
uh, came across it and wanted Luther to come and set up the Lutheran church there, but uh, Luther smelled a rat, and so he never, never acceded to that. So again, they're going to fall under uh, one or sometimes two of that, but it's just basically the four branches, if you will. And now we're looking at which church should I look for when uh, choosing a church? What do you look at? Look at what, they, what their confessions are, what they stand on. Realize that any false doctrine is going to chip away at the cross in one way or the another. And by the way, you could say, well, we basically believe Jesus is Savior, so it's all the same. No, it's not. If you chip away enough at the cross, what's eventually going to happen to that cross? Topple, fall over. And so what you want is one that proclaims the cross and only the cross as a way of salvation. And you, you can look at it. If you had to summarize the Roman Catholic false teaching in one, with one sentence, what is it? Work righteousness. You, yes, Jesus, yes, the cross is there. Yes, Jesus did this. But you have to do this. All of a sudden, what becomes more important? What Jesus accomplished or what you have to do? It's always what you have to do. Always what you have to do becomes more important. Same thing can be said about decision theology in the Reformed Church. And basically, decision theology says, yes, Jesus died and is your Savior, but you're not fully saved until you choose to bring Christ into your heart. It's what you do. Then what becomes so important? What you have to do, this choosing you have to make. And when you don't have that great emotional high of being a Christian anymore, then you say, I've lost my faith. No, that's not how it goes. Faith is what lives in the heart. And faith can be so strong at times, and faith can be so weak at times. Look at the Apostle Peter. Lord, I want to walk on the water. Come on out. He does it. And then he sees the waves and starts sinking. At the same time, Almost, it can be strong and weak. That's just the way faith is and how much we need the Lord, the Holy Spirit working through word and sacrament. Um, so what do you look for? And I, you always use this illustration. I'll use it again. You're working outside. It's hot. You come in for a glass of water. You see a glass of, of uh, pure water, a glass of dirty water, and a glass of toilet water. <laughs> Which would you choose? It's not even a choice. It's not even a choice. And when you look at what church you want to join, you look at their teachings. And are they teaching Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus? Or do they muddy the water a little bit and say, yes, Jesus is your Savior, but you have to kind of pull him into your heart? Or do they give you toilet water? No, you got to do all these things to make up for your sins before God's even going to love you. And if you haven't done enough, there's this purgatory you go to. Um, it's the same thing. Our souls are so precious because that's heaven or hell. And we don't want to have anything that harms our soul. And realize false doctrine, um, Jesus compared false doctrine to both yeast and gangrene. Why? Yeast gets to everything. Re yeast just rises and, and goes so all over the place to raise the dough. And so false teachings can do the same. And gangrene? If it's not taken care of, rots away and causes death. And again, we want to look for what church teaches God's word is truth and purity. Um, as we go on, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, uh, verses... Uh, if, if, before we get into that, look at the, the, uh, look at the diagram on the third page. And you see there the church triumphant in heaven and the church militant on earth, that big circle, that, that big uh, oval, is um, uh, the invisible church, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints. And it's made up of church triumphant in heaven and the church militant on earth. And then you see um, the circles there um, where you have some that are almost white with a little shaded, some that's half and half, some that's almost all shaded with a little white, and then one that's completely shaded. 
And so you can have the church on earth is invisible, its members only known to God. All visible churches have hypocrites, and not all members of a visible church are members of the Holy Christian Church. Churches that teach false doctrine end up misleading people and damaging faith, so the danger of being lost may increase. Um, and so the whole aspect with those is, if they're teaching a false doctrine, um, you're going to have a lot more hypocrites in that church, people who call themselves Christian but aren't, because they're holding to a false teaching that's taken away from the cross, away from Jesus. Um, we want the church that teaches God's word and truth and purity. And then the last one says, some visible members claim to be Christian, but in visible churches claim to be Christian, but in reality they are not. The doctrine they teach and practice exclude their members from the Holy Christian Church. We talked about the, the, um, the uh, uh, Mormons. You could t say the same about Je Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses, what's their big false teaching? There's no Trinity. There's only one God, Jehovah. Yeah. And so, again, they don't have the true God. They don't have God's word and sacraments there. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, those, even though they may call themselves Christian, are not Christian church at all. Um, let's just look at the next section. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20, 27 through 31, each member of the church is part of the body. Each member of the church is a different part of the body. If you recall that illustration Paul uses there before he gets into 1 Corinthians 13, talking about love, he says, each one of you in this church are part of a body, the body of the church. But you're not all the same, because if you were all the same, if everyone were an eye, what? How could you pick something up? You couldn't pick something up. So everyone's different in that body. You're all different. You have different purposes, different functions, different gifts that God has given you as part of that church to be used for the church as a whole to make it work well. Each part of the body possesses a unique purpose. Um, you, and where do I fit in? And here's just a listing of uh, various things that are there. Um, Oops. Pastor, teacher, staff, minister, elder, organist, choir member, choir director, acolyte, husband or wife, parent, next door neighbor, co-worker, student, friend, relative. In other words, where do I fit in to this body, the church? And it really revolves around what is your vocation? What does that word vocation mean? Calling. calling. What is your calling in life? I'm a pastor. What does that mean? Okay, I'm going to be leading a congregation, standing in the place of the Lord, uh, giving them uh, word and sacrament. Staff minister, what does that mean? We have a staff minister now. What does a staff minister do? He lets me ride him down the aisle on Palm Sunday, doesn't he? <laughs> Organist, choir. Let's look at this other side. Husband or wife, parent, next door neighbor, co-worker, student, friend, relative. Your calling in life, say your calling is to be a co-worker. You're working at a company. Is that just a job or is that a calling from the Lord? It's a calling from the Lord too because what does the Lord want you to do as you work at that job? Share his word. Share his word or witness to him by what you do, faithfully working, working for his glory, that you see in everything you do, that you do it for the glory of the Lord. Well, the only time I'm really doing something for the Lord is when I'm at church. True or false? false. Completely false. Your vocation, whatever the Lord has placed, the Lord has set you in, and it can be a spouse. It can be a child, it can be a parent, it can be uh, co-work. I mean, it can be in numerous things. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of the Lord. That's the calling that the Lord has given you, wherever your place in life is, to work for his glory. Does that mean that you have to be pestering everyone at work to tell them about Jesus? No. No. What do you do? Live your faith. You live your faith. And then earn the right to share with them as a friend, here's Jesus and what he means to me. 
but it's not, it, 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 some people think any, it, it's just what you do for, the, for Jesus directly that's your calling. No. Whatever station you have been placed in life, it, it's kind of like Martin Luther's definition of a good work. What did he use to, to illustrate what a good work was? A mother changing the baby's diaper or a farmer cleaning the manure out of a stall. When done by a Christian, God says, good work. That's a good work. Good work. And uh, 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 glory to Just the vocation you're calling is whatever station God has put you in. What do we do? Everything to the glory of the Lord. And what a glorious thing it is to see that. Um, Next week, we will not have class. It's Memorial Day weekend. Um, the first weekend in June, we will start up with uh, Lesson 10. We will have the uh, uh, quiz first, the true faults, and some questions first, and then we'll get into Lesson 10, which is going to talk about prayer. Any questions? We close with prayer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.